we're going to examine the process of urine formation and then we're going to take a look at some dysfunctions of the urinary system in this video. So the first thing to say is that the chemical composition of urine reflects three different processes, filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. And so filtration is something that occurs at the glomerular capsule. So if you look at the diagram at the left and look where the red box is, this is basically where the glomerular capsule is. And at this point, water and dissolved substances move out of the blood into the nephron. So I want you to take a look at that very top sort of pink tube, which is going to be the blood vessel that leads into the glomerulus. And I want you to notice its width. Now look at the, see the little circular path that the blood takes through the glomerulus. And on the way out, there is an outgoing blood vessel. And I want you to notice that the diameter of the outgoing blood vessel is thinner than the incoming one. And what that's going to do is it's like basically putting a little bit of a crimp in a hose. It's going to raise the blood pressure. And so the blood pressure gets raised in the glomerulus and that drives substances from the bloodstream out into the nephron. Now, as I mentioned in the earlier video, cells are too big to move through this filter and so are proteins. And this is why they shouldn't be found. Now, as the fluid travels through the renal tubule, and we saw the pathway of that with, I guess, a little Pac-Man animation in the last video, as the fluid travels through the tubule, you get water and other upset substances being reabsorbed into the bloodstream. So whenever you hear filtration, you're moving from bloodstream into the nephron tubes. Whenever you hear reabsorption, you're pulling something back into the bloodstream. So I mentioned in the first video that the kidneys kind of do this whole throwing the baby out with the bathwater thing where you're throwing out the good with the bad, but you want to spend some time reabsorbing substances back into the bloodstream. Now, glucose is also brought back in. This says you should never have glucose in your urine. And I think I mentioned the uh, exceptions to that in the earlier video. And so one is in diabetes and you shouldn't have glucose in your urine. And one of the sort of dysfunctions of, about diabetes is that, or one of the diagnostics for diabetes is that you can have glucose showing up in your urine. And the reason, only reason why it shows up in your urine is because the glucose level in the bloodstream gets so high that it overcomes the ability of the renal tubule to reabsorb all of that glucose. So if you have an extraordinarily high blood glucose level, then it will show up in your urine. And so I don't think there's any doubt when you're looking at our COVID-19 crisis today that doctors really earn their money. One joke that I used to make was to say that back when doctors earned their money, um, one of the ways that diabetes got diagnosed was actually a taste test of the patient's urine. And so someone would see if that was sweet or not. And that long ago, it was basically a death sentence. So if somebody's urine tasted sweet, the doctor would basically say, okay, time to make your peace with God. You're not going to be on this planet for more than a few more weeks. So I also mentioned that if somebody has an extremely, extremely high um, level of, of glucose or sugar in a particular meal, that they may have glucose showing up in their urine. And I think the example that I gave was a kid after Halloween night. Now, the next thing I want you to notice is how the solute concentration in the medulla surrounding the nephron changes throughout the length of the tubule. So look at the diagram and look at the numbers that are on the very right. So just above the dotted line, you'll see it where it says 400. And as you move down, it says 600, 800, 1000, 1200. And what that's indicating is that the amount of solutes in the fluid surrounding the nephron tube changes or increases as you go deeper into the kidney. And you can think of this, if you'd like, as it as the basically the fluid surrounding the cells getting saltier the further that you move into the urine. So what's going to happen here as the filtrate, the fluid that's in the tubule, moves through the tubule. So follow the screen arrow as it moves down and then back up. You're going to see water move out of the tubules on the way down and move back into the tubules on the way back up. 
And so this is basically a gradient that you see happening. Now, if you look at the collecting tubule, which is the larger tube that's over on the very right, you'll see that there are arrows that are pointing out that show water moving from that nephron tube back into the kidney medulla. So this is water that does not leave the body. This is the kidney actually retaining the water. Now, this doesn't happen all the time. The water doesn't leave the, the collecting tubule like this all the time. If you're dehydrated, though, you'll produce an enzyme that's called antidiuretic hormone. And what antidiuretic hormone will do will open up channels for water that will allow it to escape the collecting duct as it moves deeper into the kidney. Now, if that hormone is not present, then the water actually does not leave the urine and you'll have a large amount of very dilute urine. So you may have noticed when you get dehydrated that your urine turns really dark and that's because it's been really concentrated. It means that a lot of water has left the collecting tubules as the filtrate has passed through the kidney. If you're drinking just a whole ton of water, you may have noticed that your urine is very clear and that's an indication that there's a lot more water than there is solutes in there. And so th in, in that case, the water is not leaving the collecting ducts as it moves down through the medulla. So blood is going to secrete some substances straight into the tubule. So these would be, these would be things that wouldn't necessarily leave in the glomerulus. So if you look at the red box on the left, it says hydrogen ions, drugs, and poisons. And so this is the reason why somebody can fail a urine test is because um, a lot of drugs and also some poisons can leave the bloodstream in the vicinity of the proximal, proximal convoluted tubule. Now you'll also see that both hydrogen and potassium, potassium in the second box and hydrogen in the third box on the right, that they get secreted into the tubule there. And so why would you want to secrete hydrogen into that tubule? The main reason why you would want to do that is to decrease the acidity of the blood. So you see the larger tube that's over on the right. We've already called this the collecting duct and this receives fluid from multiple nephrons. And at this point, you're moving this fluid to the bladder. So what is our uh, summary of the nephron function. First of all, you'll see liver cells metabolizing amino acids and releasing urea into the bloodstream. So look at number, uh, number two. At the glomerulus, filtration occurs, urea, glucose, salts, other solutes get filtered from the blood into the nephron at the filtrate. Now take a look at box number three. In reabsorption, you get water and other substances reabsorbed into the bloodstream and there are hormones which regulate this process. And in step four, so toxins can be secreted into the nephron. So there are a number of things that happen again. Filtration in which you pull everything, both good and bad out. Reabsorption in which you're trying to reabsorb the nutrients, glucose, uh, salts that you need. Uh, and then secretion where you're getting rid of additional things that you really don't want to have in the bloodstream that didn't make it out in the glomerulus. And finally, uh, box number five, urine. This is a mixture that uh, includes water, urea, which is itself a toxin, other toxins, and salts. And so I've seen, I have actually seen people talking about the benefits of drinking their own urine. And I'd have to say that's really not a good idea. And I've also heard that uh, people talking about, um, you know, drinking that if you were ever stranded on a desert island or what have you. And again, that would not be a good idea because now you know that if you're already dehydrated, you're going to be releasing concentrated urine. And that concentrated urine is going to dehydrate you even further, just the same way that drinking seawater would. So I would just say that under no circumstances is it a good idea to be drinking your own urine. Okay. One more thing to mention is called glomerular filtration rate. And this is the rate at which blood is filtered through the glomerulus. So how much blood enters the glomerulus, how much fluid is filtered through the glomerulus into the nephron tubes, this is your glomerular filtration rate. And we'll see reference to this term a little bit later on.
Okay, so there are hormones that regulate this kidney function, and a couple of different examples that I want to talk about are antidiuretic hormone and also aldosterone. So basically what antidiuretic hormone does, the name of it actually tells you. So a diuretic is something that causes increased urination. And so what that means is that an antidiuretic would be something that would inhibit increased urination. So you're basically going to retain water. And so under high ADH levels, the kidneys will decrease the water that's lost in the urine. Now aldosterone will actually cause you to retain water, but in a different fashion. So what aldosterone does is to promote the reabsorption of sodium into the bloodstream from those nephron tubes. And so basically, if you're reabsorbing more sodium, then water is going to follow by osmosis. So it reabsorbing the sodium isn't necessarily the important part here. It's the water that follows the sodium that you're actually trying to reabsorb. So why would you have both of these two hormones available if they both basically function to decrease water loss? Well, let's say that you've got a fairly high blood sodium level and you want to get rid of sodium, but you still need to hang on to water. In that case, you would want to use more antidiuretic hormone than you would aldosterone. So basically the reason why you would have more than one hormone like this is because sometimes you would like to absorb or release water independently of what's happening with the sodium. So there are a lot of, dis of illnesses that can cause kidney disease, um, diabetes, hypertension, and some autoimmune diseases. Now this says these conditions tend to damage the glomeruli, which result in a decreased glomerular filtration rate and eventually kidney failure. But actually what happens in a lot of cases is that you have an increased glomerular filtration rate initially. So let's just take diabetes as an example. So in either type 1 or type 2 diabetes, you're going to have really elevated blood glucose levels. And at higher levels than normal, blood glucose is actually toxic. It's going to damage blood vessels and it's also going to damage nervous tissue. And so you don't want to have really high blood glucose levels over the long term. And so if you're not producing enough insulin or if your insulin isn't working, then you've got to have some alternative way to get rid of the really high blood glucose levels. And what will actually happen is your body will dramatically increase the glomerular filtration rate. So it'll push a lot more fluid through the kidneys. And as it does so, it will damage the glomeruli. And uh, you may know that one of the symptoms of diabetes onset is can be actually intense thirst. And the reason why is because you're pushing so much more fluid through the glomerulus that you're producing a lot more urine. And you actually have to drink a lot more water to keep from being dehydrated. So you'll have what's called polyuria, where there's a tremendous amount of urination, and polydipsia, which is really increased thirst as a result. And so when I was having onset of diabetes, and I have no idea why I didn't recognize this, um, probably because you never can really diagnose yourself accurately, uh, but I was going through close to two gallons of water a day because I just could not get enough water to drink. Um, now, hypertension will also do the same thing because increased blood pressure will push more blood through the glomeruli. And so it has the same sort of effect that diabetes does. It'll place the glomerulus under strain, and that strain can damage the glomeruli. And one thing I didn't mention before with the diabetes is this. If the glomeruli, those blood vessels, if they take on too much damage, they can start to form scar tissue. And what scar tissue will do is it will actually act to as sort of a thickener for the filter that's present in the glomerulus. So you decrease the glomerular filtration rate and you can eventually get kidney failure. Um, some autoimmune diseases will also cause uh, the same sort of effect where you have a lot more throughput through the glomerulus through the kidneys. So we're going to take a look at some more disorders of the kidneys. And here's the first one. And this is... A pretty nasty one. It's called pyelonephritis. So now nephritis is going to be 
an inflammation or an infection of the kidneys. And so pyelonephritis usually results from urinary bladder infection that spread their way up the ureters into the kidneys. So most of these can actually be cured with antibiotics if, they, if they're diagnosed in a timely fashion. But if you'll look at the cutaway of the kidney in the diagram below, you'll see a lot of localized pus and inflammation. And what that pus and inflammation over the long term will cause is a lot of scarring of the renal tissue. And again, this scarring can cause um, blockages. It can also crowd out normal kidney tissue. And it, this really can uh, cause severe damage over the long term to kidneys. Kidney stones are granules that form in the renal pelvis. And they're made up of a variety of different substances. They can be calcium, uh, phosphate, uric acid, and protein. And how do you get these in the first place? Well, if you've got repeated urinary tract infections, this can cause it. Um, urinary pH, if you've got a pH that's too acidic or too alkaline. And another one is excess animal protein in the diet because what that does is to produce, if you're getting a ton of animal protein in the diet, you're producing a lot more of these nitrogenous wastes. And so you're gonna get a lot more uric acid buildup in the kidneys. Now, these can be small enough to just pass completely uh, unnoticed in the urine, but large stones from what I understand can be incredibly painful. And if you look at the biggest stone that's there in the kidneys, you'll see that that stone is swelling out the ureter and it's actually causing a physical blockage. Now, if you get a physical blockage like this of the kidney, you can, you can literally kill the kidney in uh, 24 to 48 hours. Okay, so here is a picture of someone with an extreme case of um, kidney stones. And, and so, um, yeah, this is a really uh, unfortunate thing to have happened. Now, I wanna make it clear that this is a really extreme example. Uh, when I saw the picture though, I couldn't help not putting it in. Uh, this picture has gone around um, as a caution against energy drinks, but this is most likely a metabolic disease that has caused this. So I, I kind of looked up um, a little bit more detail on this picture before I put it in. Okay, so one of the first signs of kidney damage you can get is the presence of albumin, which is a rather large protein or any type of blood cell in the urine. So if these things start showing up, then you've got some sort of physical damage that happens to the kidney. Now, if you have more than two thirds of the nephrons in the kidney destroyed by some sort of disease process, then you can get urea and other waste products accumulating in the blood. This is a condition that's known as uremia. Now the problem, biggest problem with uremia is that when you've got uh, this, this excess amount of urea and other waste products, then they're gonna pull water in towards them. And so you're gonna retain a lot of water, you're gonna retain a lot of salt, and this can lead to edema or fluid accumulation all around the entire body. And one of the places where this fluid can accumulate is in the sac that surrounds the heart. And this is something that can lead to heart failure. And in fact, this is what, uh, this is basically what congestive heart failure actually is. Now, if someone's um, kidneys are failing, they can undergo hemodialysis. And this is where you diffuse dissolved molecules through a membrane. And the membrane is selectively permeable. So that membrane will basically let um, a lot of things through the membrane, but not water. And so basically what you do is you surround, you run the tube through the dialysis tubing, run blood through the dialysis tubing. And then you put uh, what's called dialysate it, this is the um, fluid that that the blood will leak um, solutes or water into, and so what that's going to do is going to clean the blood of a, cleanse the blood of a lot of the toxins that are in there. You can also um, adjust the pH and maintain your water and salt balance. And there are different types of of a dialysis tubing that can accomplish different things. And so this is basically a diagram of an artificial kidney machine. And there is one thing that I want you to notice here, and it's that in hemodialysis, um, the blood and the dialysate are moving in opposite directions. And what that's going to do 
is it's going to allow for greater cleansing of the blood. So if you look at the toxins in the black, you see that most of them are leaving at first, and, but they still do leave a little bit later on. Okay, so let's wait for that to come around again. So here, well, here are the black toxins, watch them coming in. And even though their concentration is really being lowered towards the bottom of the diagram, most of it still leaves because the dialysate that's coming in at the bottom is fresh and has no particles in it whatsoever. Okay, so again, you're going to see um, the blood and the dialysate moving in opposite directions. And that's basically what helps make this process a lot more efficient. Okay, here is another treatment option for kidney failure if dialysis isn't really um, an, as much of an option. This is something that's called continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis or CAPD. Now what happens here, and again this is used when hemodialysis centers aren't available, you're going to see the peritoneum acting as the dialysis membrane. And if you look at the text that just appeared in the diagram to the right, it says peritoneal cavity. And the peritoneum is the actual membrane that is a part of, it's, it's the membrane that surrounds the peritoneal cavity. And so basically what's going to happen is you're going to get dialysate. If you look at the top, a uh, bag on the top right, dialysate or the dialysis solution, it's introduced into the abdominal cavity through this permanently implanted tube. So if you follow the arrow, you can see that it's coming in here. And this tube is called the peritoneal catheter. Now, what ha what's going to happen is waste and salts will pass from blood vessels that are in the abdominal wall into the dialysate. And then after this point, you're going to collect the fluid so several hours later through this disconnect tubing and through the drain line. When you've reached the end of the other options, then uh, kidney transplants can be done. And this is the replacement of a de defective kidney with a healthy donor kidney. Now, the biggest problem with this is that organ rejection is definitely possible. Um, the best match possibilities are from family members. And nowadays, the one-year survival rate is actually really good. It's 95 to 98 percent. But you run into a couple of different problems here. One is that donor organs are in short supply. And that's a problem because sometimes people don't get them in time or sometimes people are forced to take kidneys that aren't quite as, ma as good a match as they could be. Sometimes they might reject the kidney or they might not survive as long. So uh, there is one other thing that I wanted to say about that. Um, and this may sound really unusual, but when uh, you see a kidney donation happen, um, the kidneys aren't removed that are already there. Uh, the other kidney is just put in the body alongside the others. So that's one thing that I thought was really bizarre when I heard about uh, kidney transplants. Okay, so we're going to move on to disorders of the bladder, the urethra. Um, the infection, uh, the most common cause of problems are infections. Uh, urine that leaves the bladder is usually bacteria free. Um, the distal urethra in women is normally colonized with bacteria. And unfortunately, sometimes uh, harmful bacteria from the urethra gain access to the bladder. And this last bullet point says that infections are more common in females because their urethra is shorter and broader. So if you'll take a look at this diagram and look at the at the very bottom of the diagram where you see the urethra um, labeled, you can see that it's a whole lot, that the urethra is a good deal longer in men than it is in women, basically because uh, the urethra in men extends all the way through the penis, and that's going to make the urethra longer in men than in women. Okay, bladder stones can form in people of any age. And if you look at the green arrows at the bottom, you'll see that uh, these are uh, bladder stones. And a lot of the time, these can be um, um, these can a ca can cause can be a cause of bladder infections, and uh, the inflammation that comes along with them. And this can sometimes happen at, with prostate enlargement in men. Now, these can actually be kidney stones that were carried to the bladder, um, and sometimes they'll continue to accumulate in terms of their size. And how do you get rid of them? Uh, sometimes they require surgery, and sometimes it can be broken apart by something that calls, that's called lithotripsy. And that's basically when they're hit with uh, basically shock waves in a tub, and that breaks the, the uh, bladder stones apart. Here's another example of the uh, of bladder stones in this x-ray. 
Bladder cancer is the most common type of cancer that affects the urinary sister, uh, system, and it's a little bit more common than you might think. It's the fourth most common type of cancer in men and the tenth most common in women. You have a really greatly increased risk of this with smoking. And although I know it makes a whole lot of sense for, for you to be at increased risk of lung cancer with smoking, and it may not make as much sense with bladder cancer, there is a greatly increased risk with smoking. Um, the problem with bladder cancer is that it can be really, really malignant, meaning that it can grow really fast and, and it can also metastasize really fast. And the reason why is because um, most of the time bladder cancer arises from the epithelium that lines the interior of the urinary bladder. And epithelial tissue under normal circumstances has a high rate of cell division. But when that goes out of control, then you can have a cancer that is extremely, that grows extremely fast and, um, and colonizes other parts of the body extremely fast too. Okay, and this is a picture of uh, bladder cancer, if you look down under the right. So what happens if somebody does get their bladder removed? Uh, one of the interesting things that, that we see now is that um, researchers have had success recently growing entire human bladders in the lab and they can implant them into a limited number of patients. And if you could possibly um, get this grown from your own cell samples, that would be the absolute ideal thing, because at that point, you don't get any kind of rejection whatsoever. Um, so clinical trials of these uh, replacement bladders, these are currently ongoing. Now, the last thing that we're going to do in this video is to talk about how endothermy evolved independently in birds and mammals. So basically birds and mammals are descendants of reptiles, but very different lines of reptiles. And so um, because both of them are descendants of cold blooded reptiles, researchers uh, hypothesized that endothermy in birds and endothermy in mammals evolved independently. And so what kind of adaptations would you have for endothermy? Fur and feathers, these minimize heat loss to the environment. And why would you want to have this kind of insulation? The reason why is basically because um, you're generating heat from metabolism. And if you're spending um, all of this energy trying to generate heat, you don't want to lose it. So adaptations that minimize heat uh, would be selected for in organisms that have endothermy. So another thing to realize is that endothermy requires a high metabolic rate, which means if you're carrying out a high amount of metabolism, you have to have a very large amount of oxygen. So mammals and birds have got really high breathing rates. Now, one of the problems you have with higher breathing rates is that you have a higher potential loss of both heat and water from an animal's body. And if you look at this skull, this skull is basically a rodent skull. And how do endotherms minimize this loss with um, structures that are called turbinates that help direct the flow in a specific fashion within the nasal cavity? So um, the evolution or the appearance of these turbinates um, that direct airflow well, this didn't happen all at once. So basically what scientists did was to look at fossils from several points along the evolution of the mammal lineage and the evolution of bird lineages. And so this would be animals that lived before and after the evolution of the um, endothermy itself and of fur and of feathers. And the idea here was to approximate when endothermy appeared in the ancestors of mammals and birds. So what's your evidence that these um, turbinates are necessary or a very important component of endothermy? Well, about 99%, more than 99% of all existing birds and mammals have them, and there aren't any ectotherms, any cold-blooded animals that have them. So basically, because of these turbinates, the nasal cavities of existing endotherms have a higher cross-sectional area. And so 
researchers thought that these turbinates could be used as indirect evidence of endothermy in extinct animals. So when you see these turbinates in fossils, you can hypothesize at that point that those animals were most likely warm-blooded. Now, um, researchers found that there are turbinates in therapsids that lived during the Permian period, um, and these were these were actually the ancestors. Uh, the rhapsids were the ancestors of mammals. Uh, so you see these turbinates showing up in these mammalian ancestors, uh, but you don't see fur showing up um, until the Triassic period, which is millions of years later. And so the thought here is that because the turbinates were present first before the fur, that, um, that the ancestors of mammals developed warm-bloodedness, endothermy, long before they actually developed fur. So, on the other hand, with, with, bird, with the bird lineage, feathers existed at least 150 million years ago, but the feathered dinosaurs actually had ectotherm-like nasal cavities, and so they didn't have turbinates yet. So feathers predated endothermy um, in the ancestors of birds, and so you've got a couple of very different things happening. You've got turbinates before fur in mammals, but you've got feathers before turbinates in, in um, bird.